Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to have you here to talk about your new book, Cultural Analysis Now. As I mentioned, it's such a fabulous book. I'm so glad that you made it and I learned so much from it. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yes, we're very happy to um, introduce this book to you, listeners. Um, this book project came about because this interesting psychoanalyst, critical theorist, sociologist, Alfred Lorenzer, had not been known in the Anglophone world at all. And we really love his ideas and concepts. And he's one of these thinkers who deeply connect psychoanalysis with social theory. And he does that even when thinking about the drive. So for him, the drive itself emerges um, through interactions and it's both natural and societal. And maybe Stefan, you wanna continue talking about what Lorenza also stands for. Um, well, I mean, I was just, I was struck rereading, rereading the, I mean, we, we published it a year ago uh, or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And I, so I came, to, that, but, yeah. mm -hmm, so I came to the office uh, an hour before to, to reread some of the parts. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm coming into the project as uh, somebody very enmeshed in psychosocial studies. Um, but also from a media and communication studies perspective. And um, I think what what really brought me to uh, Lorenza was the, the kind of, um, it reintroduced psychoanalysis into, into Frankfurt School critical theory, but it also has those concepts that are so so current for, for media studies, especially, and here, especially mm -hmm. the, the scenic, right? The concept of the scene that, um, that um, you know, that, that drive um, and kind of um, the relational, that, that, um, that subjective, intersubjective relations um, need to be understood in, um, by the means of the scenic in scenes that um, that the scenic is actually like the first analytic category in Lorenz's theory, so that um, that the unconscious that drives and that kind of relational formations have to be thought of departing from from scenes, and that is also meant as concrete scenes, like no social scenes microscopic ones quite often, like how I meet people and how I'm being met, how I am in those relationships, almost by default, you know, what, what goes without saying for me, what I'm not reflecting about. Mm -hmm. That is like uh, infinitely uh, interesting, I think. Maybe we should say a little bit about this idea of the scenic and introduce people to it because I, I think it is really a, a wonderful place to start to, to explain. And there is a tremendous amount of his theory in this pretty short book, but I think certainly for me, it was also um, the first thing I was able to grab onto and the, the part of Lorenzo's thinking that seemed both kind of a, a really radical move uh, although he does ground it in his reading of Freud, and also something that was immediately useful um, in both kind of theorizing, but also in clinical work. Um, I, I come to this through as a as a clinician, not as an academic. Uh, mm. But that was um, even though he's he's using the idea of the scene in in this book to talk about the analysis of culture. Uh, it, it seemed immediately important both for cultural analysis and for clinical uh, psychology, clinical work. Um, and so maybe we can talk a little bit about how he centralizes the idea of the scene and, and what he means by the scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who is giving the the first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it starts. It starts, of course, with the original original scene. Uh, the original scene, which of course is is paradigmatic, 
the original first scene, primal scene. No, it's not the primal scene. That would be the Urszene. scene. But mm -hmm. the um, the feeding scene between mother and baby, that's where the theory starts. So it's really about this very first interaction. And it's an interaction in which obviously there is this infant, the newborn, and there is an intense need, biological need. This infant needs food. It needs warmth and love and safety and all of that. And, and then the, the infant is put to the breast or gets milk, gets fed by the first person, the, the first adult person. And in this first interaction, we have at once the satisfaction of a need and at the same time something else is being set in motion something else happens and that is the infant experiences pleasure and that's that's the the, the basic scene that's the how the pleasure principle is being set in motion and how the drive the sexual drive seeking pleasure for pleasure's sake is being set in motion and I think to, to describe it as a scene, I mean, this is a familiar scene in a lot of psychoanalytic theory. I mean, this is certainly all over the place in Klein and then a lot of people in, in Winnicott, but, but to describe it as a scene leaves in all of the, what we might otherwise think of as incidental parts that it's not it's not a, a mother object or it's not an object that is some there is some projections and interjections and the interplay of that it's it's the full thing taking place and it includes all the things that we might otherwise ignore the room that it's taking place in the uh who else is in that room um the the noise that's around all these things become I was going to say centralized, but it's really not decentralized, not ignored mm. in the focus on the scene. And in so much of our theory, the the objects are the center of our focus and everything outside of the objects is, is ignored, including the other objects, uh, including the other people who might be in the room for this sort of thing. Mm. Um, you know, we tend to, Freud doesn't talk about anything really much before the Oedipal, uh, or at least he doesn't talk about it. He doesn't, he doesn't centralize that. Uh, and then when we centralize the pre-Oedipal, we just throw out everything, all of the social and all of the paternal function until the child is older. And in focusing on the scene, we don't need to have this dichotomy between the period when there isn't the social and the period where there is the social. Yeah. And it also leaves room for the voyeur or the person like in watching the scene as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And everything that everything that would kind of qualify, tone down, um, uh, darken the the kind of the pleasure the flow of pleasure in that scene too, right? And I think this is mm. so me methodically what, or me methodologically what comes into this picture pretty quickly then is the question of, okay, what, you know, um, like uh, colloquially speaking, what makes a scene here? Um, like how does this uh, primary caretaker um, handle the child? how is the infant then uh, refusing or collaborating, uh, becoming confused? Uh, what, might, what might darken the, the picture here and what kind of, um, what might hamper the, the, the two-way flow and the exchange of, of pleasure and uh, of, of nourishment and nurture in this scene? And that is also where, where um, where then the interest goes in the in the analysis of those scenes, 
And the analysis would then also ask um, a little bit along the lines of what, what Dan already introduced, like so where where do the socio, the social and cultural aspects enter into this very intimate scene already? How can we interpret the interactions between these two, these two people um, in terms that do not uh, do not bracket the social and the cultural? And um, so how um, does that make a cultural difference? Like where where do um, the cultural aspects lie that are not easily articulable, um, to be easily to be articulated in such a scene? That's where the interest would go. So what makes a scene in a scene, colloquially speaking? Yeah, and his idea of the unconscious is so very different. After like being immersed in Lacan for so different so many years, it's like, wait, it's not structured like a language. <laughs> it's like, how refreshing. <laughs> right. So Lorenz also has this it, it, it's a theory of socialization and symbolization, what he lays out here in this in this book and the essay we translated, it's it's very dense. But his work is based on this theory of symbolization, and he um, thinks of Lacan and then also contradicts Lacan. So I think we can find similarities, but then also this major, major difference where Lorenz mm -hmm. um, says that the unconscious is um, is. outside of language, um, is before language, starts before language, and he goes back to this idea of Sachvorstellung, Wortvorstellung, the experience of things, which then Lorenza says it's not things, it's scenes, really, scenes, it's interactions with others, it's all the sensory experience that then will become more and more symbolized but there is not only the symbolization into language, but also symbolization um, in the arts, the visual arts, music, all of these would be forms of symbolization that um, are closer to um, Winnicott's uh, thinking than, than Lacan's thinking and into patterns of interaction and patterns of, of physical movement that yeah. need not and often are not um, connected to, to words or thoughts um, and which he uses to understand the idea of repetition in, in a very different way. Hmm. I, I've, I've become, I mean, in my essay in the, in the collection, I've, um, I've become quite obsessed with um, with the um, with the position and the the value of language in in Lorenzo. So it's um and it is a bit of a it's a bit of a rough ride when you try to read um, Lorenzo from the early seventies into the late eighties and how um, there's not there's not even much of a of a of a change or development there, but there is a, there are almost two theoretical Lorenzes in play. Like, um, and that doesn't, that doesn't go so much into, into um, questions of language. So, so the unconscious is really like firmly defined as, um, as a prelingual, like a, a realm lying somehow out of language and being informed by. By um, by embodied, affectual, scenic ways of of being in the world. However, how language is then kind of associated with it and kind of overlaying and kind of worked into those unconscious forms of being that uh, that becomes a, almost enigmatic, but productively so. So in in my in my essay in my um, chapter. Of the book, I'm trying to trying to show the two Lawrences at work there. So there's um, the one um, theoretical um, current that goes to 
um, that basically says like, yeah, we can like, everything that is unconscious can be moved into the symbolic again and can be articulated and can be made conscious. And then there's the other Lorenzo who would very much go against that. So there's the kind of modern Lorenzo and the postmodern Lorenzo who is much closer to Lacan then. And I think he's also, he's getting more influenced by Lacan than he sometimes, than he sometimes uh, allows us to see in the way that he then assesses um, cultural productions and the, the sensual symbolic and how one can articulate experience, unconscious experience and how not. And there he kind of is almost like a little bit of a con, like where he kind of comes closer to Lacan in the way of like, yeah, we can, we can approximate it, but we perhaps cannot put the lid on the articulation of the unconscious in cultural analysis. It's, it's a, like really a, a fascinating journey for me <laughs> to uh, to read Lorenza, and I think there's something very, very, um, very productive in those two strains in in uh, his theoretical writing that go against each other, which I also try to capture in the kind of like so, so. What shall be the form of us interpreting then in the cultural realm? And I think it's it's almost like yet yeah, we have to be assertive and we have to make bold statements, but always in a way that leaves an opening for the possibility that it might be completely different. I love that. Yeah. So, so it's also um, taken seriously, it would be the interminable analysis. We might have a moment of, oh yes, this is it with a patient or with a social study, whatever we are trying to understand. But then uh, there's something else that doesn't fit. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Always. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, even with even with um, cultural artifacts, artistic artifacts that don't change. But we change and culture keeps changing and the social context keeps changing around them. So they, um, in this way, their functions and meanings also take on, like they also change with mm -hmm. us. And maybe that's also a nice uh, little link to La Planche and the idea of translation and retranslation that we do in the analytic work um, is is helping to detranslate and then find new translations for the um, for unconscious, for experiences, for forms of interaction. We would say with Lorenza. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the unconscious in translation. Just have to plug Jonathan's yeah. press real quick <laughs> that this book yeah. is on. That seemed like the perfect point. <laughs> I love Jonathan House's press, Unconscious in Translation, which is this book is on. He's doing so much great work. And yeah. hopefully you'll get to uh, translate more Lorenzo on it too. So we can have more in the Anglophone hmm. community. Yeah, as as Ooh. much as <laughs> Lorenzo books as Lacan books in this, in the uh, in the in the publishing house that'd be <laughs> the goal but yeah i mean like this took us seven years wow yeah so yeah, uh, i was gonna say i thought that when we talked before kat that you were working on this yes mm. we talked two years ago and i said it's gonna come out soon <laughs> 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 and then there was a little bit of a delay there was a lot there, there going were a few on, drafts. so I think it's okay. <laughs> a few drafts, a few dozen drafts, a few yeah. hundred drafts. I, I think I have about seven proofing versions of the thing. <laughs> I, I can't bring myself to delete any of them, and so they, <laughs> they set in an enormous... <laughs> but 
you know, just just reading through passages again, and I I read the uh, I reread the the Michelle Stevens piece. Mm. I was, I I you know I was overcome with a sense of pride. I think it's it, it's a really lovely manuscript, and uh, like I at least in the parts that I now reread, I didn't find, I didn't find a mistake. So you know, there's Ooh. something. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I wonder if we if we shouldn't talk a little bit about some of the actual cultural analysis he does in the text, because he lays out these heady reformulations of drive theory, of repression, of the scene, obviously. Um, but then he shows off a little bit of what he can do with it uh, in, in a few places. And I think those are those are maybe the moments where you see the kind of interpretive power of this and you see how kind of um, how open and broad the interpretations he's able to make are um, mm -hmm. and and what it means to take in not just one scene, but multiple scenes uh, when discussing in this book, mostly artistic works. And, and he's mostly going over uh, Freud's analysis of, of, uh, the Michelangelo and of Ibsen and a few other things, uh, but he he really he has these moments of I think incredible brilliance of taking Freud's analysis and looking at the scene of Freud doing the analysis, the scene of the text of the analysis, the scene of himself interacting with the analysis and the effect that the analysis has on him and playing that off the effect that the the art or mm. in particular when he's talking about the Moses uh, had on Freud and, and you know the real historical person Freud and who he was looking at the Moses of Michelangelo and he brings these all together in these ways that are I think somewhat jaw-dropping for me and I I think maybe that that shows off what he's doing, not just in the really interesting theory that he's making, uh, but in what you can do with this theory and and how you can look at culture. And and I think particularly for the the English speaking readers who, who will hopefully read this, uh, it's very different from what a lot of psychoanalytic. Um, cultural critique has looked like where the psychoanalytic theory is the overlay onto the the object onto whatever it is being studied and this really tries to use psychoanalytic method and not psychoanalytic theory do something equivalent in rigor to the psychoanalytic session in trying to understand art yeah and you know what then i i, I wished he had done more of it because yeah. most of his texts are uh, almost exclusively theoretical or theoretical methodological and mm -hmm. uh, and I'm 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 very glad that we that we um translated such a central text and it's really it's mm -hmm. like it's very much like um like a, a heritage piece, right? Mm. Uh, I, I really wish he had even shown, like, shown that brilliance more systematically. Also, in some pieces, there's this mm. the, uh, another, like, another book length um, study uh, from 1982, where he looks at the um, at the Reformation of the Catholic Church, and he does a little bit in there too. I wished he had picked up a little bit more popular culture. Because then I would also like you know that would be a text I would uh, like to for, for us to translate <laughs> next. Didn't do much of it. I think he mentions. I think he has a couple of pages on Elvis Presley in this 1980 <laughs> book. <laughs> yeah, which is really just too old for my students to to translate. But I, also, <laughs> I think you you came to the core of what is also. So important for me, and in uh, you know, I, I'm teaching a, a, meth a methods course in textual analysis, and uh, you know, psychoanalysis has not been um, central to media studies in the past couple of decades. 
Uh, and even though this is a, um, a small, like five ECTS point course, so not many seminar sessions, but I have one on psychoanalysis and I can pull that off and students are really happy with it because I'm approaching it in a Lorenzerian way, which means mm -hmm. like you don't take, and that is also good for students who are not versed in, in um, psychoanalytic theory, because you can approach cultural objects, media objects, in um in a psychoanalytic mode so it's the praxis you know it's like the kind of um it's the kind of it's the evenly hovering attention it is trying to produce free association in relation to to an object it's trying to bring out your own kind of trying to make yourself aware of your own affective emotional responses to the piece while keeping the historical and cultural context of the piece also in mind. So it's holding on to those two and more um, currents in, in, in your meeting with a, with, a, with a media text or with a like, you know, cultural object that is so important. And that is something that, that you actually can teach and can kind of um, show how to do in a session or two. And there's quite a lot of my students who, who enjoy that very much because it brings, it gives them an opportunity to bring their own subjectivity into the picture, into the meeting without discarding uh, historical contexts or mm -hmm. political, you know, political contexts. Mm -hmm. Well, and you see there the the hermeneutics, uh, the original title of, of the piece we translated, which we haven't mentioned yet, uh, is In-Depth Hermeneutical Cultural Analysis, which we decided not to call the book for, I think, reasons that are quite obvious. Uh, <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> but Lorenzo considers psychoanalysis to be a, a hermeneutical endeavor, that you are getting your information from what the patient says, from their affect, from their body, but also yourself as a source, kind of transference, um, and also your knowledge of your own cultural entrance and your patient's cultural background. And, and so all of these things are going into how you understand any given moment in a session. And that's the that's the rigor he wants to bring to cultural analysis as well. That all of those things are in are, are necessary for an interpretation, not just a kind of um, not just a, a pre written theoretical idea or a kind of story that comes from you know the Oedipal story that comes from Freud's writing put on top of say Hamlet. Um, one of the few moments he's critical of Freud in this book is he says, you know, Freud's analysis of Hamlet, all he said was this story is the same as this story. And I think he's quite right that that's not a particularly interesting thing to do with cultural analysis. Uh, and much more interesting, for instance, when he talks about Freud's uh, analysis of Oedipus is uh, this early moment where Freud is getting information, not just from the text of the play, but the reaction of the audience that he knows from studying the history of it, uh, that, and I'm not gonna remember the line perfectly, but he writes that everyone in the audience has a moment of catharsis because they all know this somewhere inside themselves. And so there he has two sources he's relying on. He has both the text and what he knows of the history of it. And so he can make a kind of sort of simple hermeneutical move to, explain why this is something that he wants to ascribe to everybody and why this is going to occupy a central place in his theory. Um, and Lorenzo wants to open this up even more widely and talk not just about what the reaction of the, the historical reaction of the crowd is, but also the reaction of the reader of Freud in this case, as he's making this theory and, and what's going into making this theory. And he wants that to be his, his his starting place for constructing an interpretation. Hmm. 
sorry, I'm getting more and more sunspots. I have to yeah, you, move in. Is that the I sun the shining? <laughs> yes, that's the sun. That's the sun. It's still yeah. it's only 1230 light. where yeah. I am. Must be nice, yeah. yeah <laughs> it's so nice. We haven't seen that in a while. I haven't mm -hmm. seen the sun in weeks. <laughs> <laughs> If I may continue with like one brief thought, I think this is what you know what I and I, what I appreciate so much about Pascal Soler's piece, mm -hmm. like um, yeah. um, chapter in our book, is that um, he comes from a, a clinical perspective, if I understand it rightly, but mm -hmm. he makes a point. And he uses Lorenz's text to make that point, but pushes the text in Lorenz's project a little bit further to argue for the um, for a cultural, like for a psychoanalytic cultural analysis, not kind of coming in at second place, not just kind of being something that might complement clinical analysis or kind of might. Um, might develop out or derive from clinical analysis, but um, as something in its own right, with its own project, and almost having in our times also just, well, I mean, not precedence, but well, perhaps he says that, right? But um, like, if not precedence, but like has an equally important role to play in the clinic. Because, you know, because it happens so often that political, cultural, social aspects are bracketed out and then hamper, hamper understanding, mm -hmm. says the guy who is not a clinical analyst. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, 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 I think that, that is... That... I found this really fascinating because uh, you know it it broke with my like unconscious understanding of myself as you know this is something that comes from you know clinical practice and then we develop further kind of like you know it, it, and it kind of broke with this tacit self understanding and giving me kind of like and my the the method that I love so much like a dignity that I that I realized mm -hmm. I hadn't given it myself for quite a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Pascal Sauver's chapter is entitled uh, Applied Psychoanalysis, Cultural and Clinical. Exactly. Yeah. So it highlights the, the primacy of the method, the psychoanalytic method of scenic understanding, a la Lorenza. Yeah. And what are the two applications? cultural analysis and clinical analysis. <coughs> and so, so yes, they, they have their own, um, they have their own uh, realm. Yeah. And one doesn't dominate the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you pointed out right in the beginning of the book, there's always been Freud was doing cultural analysis and works uh, analyzing works of art and society and politics from the beginning, you know. So this whole mm -hmm. argument of like, you know, everyone in psychoanalysis, at least in the U.S., is like freaking out that we're like including the social, you know, like this is the end of psychoanalysis as we know it. It's like, but it's always been this way. <laughs> Why are you all freaking out? <laughs> yes. And Freud also had scenes that were vital to understanding sort of the general psychology, the general structure of the mind. The difference between Lorenzo and Freud in this regard is that for Freud, the scenes were in our prehistory. They were these phylogenetic scenes, but you there is very little of Freud's theory that doesn't rely in some way or another on the scenic, which is has to be a cultural moment, is, is part of cultural analysis. The the primal horde and the um the primal scene and um 
the the the, the Oedipal uh, scene that that all of these things were for Freud real things that happened, and they were not simply about the kind of internalized object, the the internalization of a character from your life. They were about a whole cultural thing that happened in history. And Lorenzo, I think quite rightly, drops the idea of the phylogenetic. Um, I, I think a lot of people are dropping the idea of the phylogenetic, certainly Laplanche writes quite damningly of it and makes these scenes, these structuring scenes, real things that happen in one's life, which opens us up clinically to being curious about the structure of our patients' minds. And this is, I think, a point Pascal makes, which opens us up clinically to being curious about the structure of our patients' minds and the scenes that created that structure. But we don't have to rely on these these phylogenetically theorized scenes, we can look at their real life and the real surroundings and the real experiences that they had, not just traumatic experiences as the kind of trauma theorists would have it, but all sorts of experiences. And we can look as broadly as we like and find not just kind of ancillary things that affect our diagnosis in the way that the cultural is sometimes brought in, but things that are absolutely central to the structure of someone's mind. And then also turning that into the like or taking this and um and positioning it in the realm of cultural analysis is also like you know this has in in my case it's given me it's given me an understanding of how I can conceptualize and how I can trace and analyze identify in the first place um like what is really driving cultural change and social change what you know, because these are so often not the things that we are aware of we are conscious about but these are the scenes that we do not that do not enter consciousness so easily and sometimes not at all you know that really like that not only structure minds but then also structure you know the realms of culture within which people interact and kind of um, have an unspoken common sense, uh, like the, the ways that makes us, you know, like just um, quite seamlessly um, encounter one another, but uh, also quite seamlessly um, do damage to each other or people will fall out of the frame whenever whenever that happens so it's um so it's it's really i think it's in this kind of uh in the dialectics of kind of looking at uh, interactions on the micro level of kind of where the 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 the, the consulting room the um the the clinical space is almost um kind of paradigmatic space and um and then kind of positioning that elsewhere and then mm -hmm. see very kind of cautiously trying to develop okay what happens if we take such a thing out of here and looking at it out there and scenes that come to mind that are so uh structuring our body minds are for instance the experience of complete helplessness um, in infancy and mm -hmm. the helplessness and powerlessness in power relationships that run through society from the micro mm -hmm. level to the macro level. And with this method, those are, this is an example of, of, of a scene, like a scene of domination and submission, for instance, that, mm -hmm. that can be looked at, at in the consulting room as well as how how scenes like that play out um, with a huge unconscious dimension to them, for instance, on social media. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I've been I was invited to speak at a conference about Otto Rank next year. So I've been immersing myself in him mm -hmm. and yeah, even the trauma of birth, this like birth scene is really yeah. interesting to think about as well.
Right, that's a scene. Quite an intense scene. <laughs> one one scene that that came to mind is the one that um, that Peter Redman, uh, a colleague of ours from uh, from the UK, who who helped us uh, with with the book quite a bit. So I think it's, uh, it's like he deserves the mention. So Peter Redman, Mathilde um, Bereswil, and Christina Morgo, they have this. Um, a kind of introduction to to Lorenz uh, in a, in a psychoanalysis culture and society issue special issue from two thousand and ten, and in order to explain a little bit where where the methodology um, is so fruitful, they um, they have this example from a um, from the analysis of a reality television show. It was I think it was even Big Brother. And uh, they, they um, like a colleague had done focus groups or discussion groups with viewers of the show. And uh, one was telling a scene where she got so upset about something that happened on Big Brother that she wanted to grab her phone and then vote somebody out. Uh, and then like, uh, this is quite a while back, then her mobile phone being, uh, being out of service or something. So she darts out to one of the remaining telephone booths and, uh, and to her <laughs> frustration finds the telephone booth of there is already somebody in there. <laughs> and then so and then like uh, so she's really worked up in anger about like what happened on Big Brother, but she's apparently there's also something else going on, right? And she's banging on the telephone booth to get that other person. Out. And then she just like said, yeah, like, yeah, I just wanted them out. You know, and like the way that this kind of I just wanted them out um, just ties in on so many different levels, creates a scene as a kind of, it's almost like in you know, a Lacanian kilting point you know where they like where um mm -hmm. something subjective enters but also like something about um the the function and the malfunction of reality television in people's lives mm -hmm. and how like, you know how everything like how how the cultural social and subjective are becoming enmeshed in uh, within each like in each other is uh, is coming to the fore so nicely so it's like always like my go to place when I try to find a good example of a Lorenzerian theme scene <laughs> in, in um, yeah in, like you know something that pertains also to cultural studies and media studies that's yeah. the, mm -hmm. that's the arch scene for me <laughs> that is that is so rich. Like, and what she's doing now, she's trying to get this person out of the phone booth. But this this kind of exclusionary violence has to be enacted somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know what, what is even more interesting is that the person that uh, she is trying to vote out um, mm -hmm. from the show is one that she had experienced as extremely amoral and antisocial so there is something in this kind of in the <coughs> urgency of wanting somebody out but also like for all the right reasons right so it's mm -hmm. like how, how amoral moral um you know how kind of ethical questions are also kind of tied into that like in a very dilemmatic form it's also just stunning <laughs> And I think if from a clinical perspective, if you could, you could very easily take this as some kind of a repetition of a relationship that that this this person is a meaningful object. And, and that's not wrong, I'm sure, you know, to, to this person who's so desperately trying to have them kicked off. But to look at the whole scene, to expand our focus, to look at the whole scene, we see not just the object relationship, but the whole trying to get them kicked out, the failure to get them kicked out, the interruption of the being kicked out, and and it connects it to a whole world of similar scenes. And we can think about other scenes of expulsion and attempted expulsion, not just in this person's life, but certainly we can think of that, but of how this is a broader cultural story and what this relates to. And 
my goodness, it, it, it goes so many different possible directions. Yeah. Yeah. What I like about the direction that uh, that cultural analysis a la Lorenza kind of suggests is also toward the um, the utopian that there's something mm -hmm. in this, I mean, harshly aggressive action that is also that points to a, a kind of utopian horizon because the reason why this person rushes out trying to find a phone booth and then tr like tries to kick somebody out of the phone booth and then also somebody out of um, a reality TV show and out of their life is also because, oh, now the lights are off. Right? <laughs> it's also because- Now you have to um, say something very dramatic. Yeah, no, it is also <laughs> that you try to intervene in the social, in in a pro-social way, right? She's trying to repair something, or like this person is trying to repair something in the social. Like so, it has, mm -hmm. you know, you like Lorenza always asks us to also like to kind of not lose from sight the kind of utopian horizon, and he does that with Ernst Bloch and the notion of the not yet conscious, right? Like not only an unconscious that. Of like that you need to reconstruct or try to reconstruct by looking into past relationships, but also something that always points us into the future and toward the toward a utopian horizon. I like that very much. It's beautiful. And as we're nearing the end of time, was there anything that you wanted to be sure to mention that we hadn't gotten to yet? I've been doing that with the utopian just now. I was like, <laughs> at the time I was thinking, okay, I need to get the utopian into into the podcast. Nicely done. <laughs> yeah. so I leave it to you, to, to the two of you, Kat and Dan. Well, read cultural analysis now, which is the get this book <laughs> by Alfred Lorenzer, but also there uh, for. Uh, wonderful chapters by Steffen, by Pascal Sauver, Michelle Stevens, and Vera King that are takes on Lorenza from um, a research perspective and from a clinical perspective. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend. Yeah, just to echo that, I, I think what's what I feel most proud of in this book is both that there is this wonderful text that's available for English speaking audiences, but also that there are these four chapters that take really different perspectives that take totally different parts of the text and do such wonderful, interesting things with it. And it, it shows the potential that comes from a, a deep interaction with the text. Mm. Absolutely. I can only echo what I said in the beginning. I learned so much from reading this book. I'm really happy to be, have uh, become familiar with his work. And like you said, all of the essays afterwards, I felt like my mind kept having like little epiphanies and feelings of inspiration, which I haven't had in a while, <laughs> I guess, because I always read the same people. But it was, <laughs> it was really nice to kind of get my brain firing in new ways and making new connections, you know. Um, and that's something like with Lacan, like with the unconscious structure, like a language. I, I've always had a hard time with that. I understand it like theoretically, but I don't see it clinically. So I've kind of leaned more towards Laplanche in recent years. And that's it. I've gotten like everything on Jonathan's press. I just think this whole, the whole unconscious and translation is doing fantastic work. Um, so this really like built really nicely on that. And I think with reading the auto rank as well, it's like I've got a kind of a new combination of theorists in my mind. And it's really, yeah, getting me excited to write something again which i haven't been in a while i think since probably oh, the fantastic. pandemic started that that's awesome nice yeah so thank you thank you i highly recommend it thank you all for coming on and you're welcome back thank anytime you. i'm gonna see you, you so next week yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly see you in a couple of days Vanessa. <laughs> yeah and anytime you have a new book or an event or project or you just want to talk about psychoanalysis you know you're always welcome back Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.